Christian assumptions are being used to criticize Christian doctrines and vice versa. It's, it, and, and it's terribly confusing. And I, I think I cannot think of a single aspect of the culture wars in America th that are not essentially intra-Christian theological arguments. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Tonight, I have a very special guest, Tom Holland, the British historian, not the actor. And the reason it's 10.30 p.m. my time in Los Angeles is because it's 6.30 a.m. his time in London. And we're going to be talking about his book, Dominion. The subtitle is How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. It's a fascinating fascinating book. And Tom Holland is an award-winning historian of the ancient world and the author of six previous books, including Rubicon and Persian Fire. He contributes regularly to The Guardian, The Times of London, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. And obviously, he, as I said, he lives in London. So welcome. Good morning, Tom Holland. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. And um now, we're going to talk about your amazing book, Dominion, and you've written this book, and th it's in three parts. It's There's Antiquity, Christendom, and Modernitas, which is modernity. And um, I'm just going to quote uh, a couple things in the, a couple sentences in the preface, and then I'm going to ask you to explain yourself. Um, you say, my ambition in this book is hubristic enough as it is to explore how we in the West came to be what we are and to think that the way that we do. And then you go on to say, to live in a Western country is to live in a society still utterly saturated by Christian concepts and assumptions. Yeah. So talk about that and what on earth compelled you to write this tome? Well, it was, it was a slow process on my part, a slow process of realizing that, um, essentially the air I was breathing was completely Christian. And it was formulated for me by the fact that my prime interest, both as a child, as a young, a young writer, uh, as a historian, was pre-Christian classical antiquity. And the more I wrote about it, the more I tried to get into the minds of the Spartans, the Romans, whoever, um, the more I tried to write about these people using English, the more I discovered that I was looking at them through a glass darkly. So to go back to the idea of using English, I, I found that um, there were so many words that were hopeless, I felt, anachronistic, uh, distorting when applied to pre-Christian peoples. And it took me time to realize that actually it was Christianity that was kind of providing the distortion. And it brought home to me the fact that if even the very language that I use is so saturated in Christian assumptions, how much more must everything else be? The way mm. that, um, I, I suppose the the obvious um, the the obvious sense that people will think when I say that that we have Christian assumptions is in the dimensions of morality and ethics, right. and that's absolutely true. But it's more than that. It's about assumptions about how I view society, about how um, I regard fairly fundamental issues like sexuality, like the way that. Um, society should be structured, all these kind of things, things that I had just assumed were the way things are, that, that bred of human nature, bred of the kind of the very fundamentals of what it is to be human. I came to realize they're actually very, very culturally contingent. And specifically, that culture is, I think, Christian. And I wrote Dominion to essentially stress test that thesis and to see if I could trace the process by which um, Christianity came to transform the world of classical antiquity and then the world of, of uh, European paganism. 
And then over the course of the centuries and the millennia, as Europeans expand, you know, crossed the oceans and colonized and settled vast swathes of the world, and indeed to rule as colonial powers vast swathes of the world, how European assumptions came to have a profound effect even on the non-Christian world. Yeah. And were you, and so were, were you, ra- what city were you raised in in England? So I was raised outside Salisbury, um, which is probably, if uh, American listeners would probably know it for Stonehenge, which right. um, as in Spinal Tap, um, <laughs> although those of us who grew up near Stonehenge, we're very offended by that, um, or, and, and by our cathedral, which is 102, three, 123 feet um, and uh, the two Russian agents pretended that this is why they had come to, to Salisbury, whereas in fact they had come to poison um, uh, a, a, a spy that had defected to Britain um, with Novichok and oh, wow. almost okay. wiped out our city. So, um, And did, were you the, raised the, in the Church of England? I was raised in the church. So I was raised in an absolutely a kind of Agatha Christie type village outside Salisbury. Um beautiful church um ancient church uh raised in the church of england my mother um is very committed member of it so i i sang in the choir unbelievably I, my voice is terrible um <laughs> i went to sunday school uh and i it, it never I, I never had any issue with kind of you know the the doctrinal teachings of christianity because i associated with my mother and with my godmother both of whom were very devout christians um mm-hmm. and who you know i essentially provided my kind of model of, of what it was to be a good person. And also I loved the biblical stories. I really loved mm-hmm. them um, because I was fascinated by everything ancient. Actually, I just, I thought ancient things were more interesting than, than modern things. Um, so well, I'd, I'd yeah. been, I'd been obsessed by dinosaurs and I just moved seamlessly on to an obsession with Romans and Babylonians and Egyptians. And the awful thing is that although I was very into the Bible, by and large, I was on the side of the very powerful rather than the children of Israel or Jesus or whatever. <laughs> so I much preferred Pharaoh or Pontius Pilate. <laughs> right. It was, it was the swagger and the glamour and the power. Um, and I kind of get moving on. It wasn't that um, it wasn't that I had some kind of reverse Damascene conversion. It wasn't a kind of blinding moment where I thought, oh, I, I don't believe any of this. It was more like a kind of dim switch turning down. But it was... It, it, the, the the kind of the sun that blotted out the moon of my faith i guess was was the the kind of the, the blaze of the greek gods and, mm-hmm. and the roman empire uh, i just kind of i found them more compelling more exciting and i came to see in a kind of gut visceral way um I, I, I came to see Christianity as a kind of a darkening. So people talk of the the dark ages succeeding the age of, of Roman power. And I, I came to see, I, you know, I would, I would almost synesthetically imagine Rome as blue skies, you know, white temples, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then I would think I would just in my mind, I would think of, of the coming of Christianity as a, as gray, drizzly weather all that kind of thing all the kind of weather you don't have in california right. yeah uh, except but it's kind of yeah. autumn day in england um and and you know all these monks ruining the fun and everything and that was that was a kind of i i now see a very lazy but but deeply rooted kind of prejudice that i think is a part of lots of people's mental furniture and it's an inheritance from the uh, from the enlightenment i now recognize um yeah but it took me, you know, it took me several decades, basically, to to kind of confront the, the prejudices and the, the the assumptions in my own mind. And so that's part of what made writing Dominion so enjoyable for me was. I kind of knew what I was writing about I, I, w- when I talked about the prejudices that lots of people have about the role that Christianity has played in history. I yeah. was, I was kind of, I, I had my youthful self on, you know, on my shoulder as I wrote it. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess I'm kind of uh, a kind of Pinker, Stephen Pinkeresque liberal who's lost his faith. Well, I'm going to get to that at the end. I want to ask you how interacting with all of these ancient texts and biblical texts and 
the patristics and the and the, the middle uh, medieval theologians, how that sh affected you if it did. But before we get into that, um, I'm going to jump to Constantine. Um, we're going to skip over the first couple centuries and jump to to the a glamorous and powerful figure, Constantine. Yeah. Um, and you say in your book, I, I think it's uh, on page one thirty. You say that. Constantine, as the story goes, had been one to the one to Christ on the eve of his great victory at the Milvian Bridge. In 1313, 1313, he issued a proclamation that gave a legal standing to Christianity, but he coyly refused to name the divinity who sits in heaven. The vagueness was deliberate. Now, what what was that all about? Well, Constantine is famous as the. Um... Uh, the, the emperor who, uh, as you said, the, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge outside Rome, he's facing a rival uh, emperor. Uh, he, he supposedly sees his vision of the cross in the sky uh, and he converts to Christianity. Um, and I think the outline of that that story is, is basically true. But there are all kinds of uh, complications, um, namely that Constantine before he turns to Christ, had been auditioning a wide range of gods for the role uh, of a, basically a supreme deity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that reflected both um, Constantine's own character. Um, he's a very domineering figure and he wants to rule the whole of the empire. This is a period when the emperor has been divided up between various, various rulers. He wants the whole empire and he wants to see himself as the earthly deputy of a single god because that automatically kind of raises his status, he thinks. Um, and there'd been this kind of trend towards a, a monotheism for a, at least a century, because the, the empire had been under incredible stress and strain. And I think that there was, again, in a kind of inchoate way, a, a succession of Caesars had come to realise that there was a need for a kind of single god who could be prayed who could be prayed to and whose power would then enable the, the empire to cohere so that the, the romans had notions of of what they called religiones Relig a religio is a bond that joins you to the gods so it could be a sacrifice it could be a priesthood it could be a celebration of a, 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 a holy day and there was this had always been how the romans had understood their rise to power that they had they had um paid the, the the ancient gods of their city their dues and the gods had favored them and this is why they had their empire the problem was that rome had become a universal empire for a century before constantine every free male in the empire had become a citizen but they the all these pizza people in in egypt or syria or spain or britain or whatever they all came from different backgrounds they all had different religiones and so the the I think Constantine's ambition is to essentially enshrine a single religio that would just clear up all the mess, it would kind of <laughs> rationalize the mess, it would give people a single focus, and he would be the image of this god. So he had he thought maybe it could be Apollo, maybe it could be Hercules, maybe it could be um the unconquered sun, but in the end it's it's Christ who passes the audition. Um, with momentous consequences, yeah, and and uh, and he was responsible for gathering the bishops together to produce the Nicene Creed, right? Right. Well, so Constantine, <laughs> I mean, with the Church, he is dealing with something that no emperor has really had to deal with before, which is a focus of power that is outside the Roman state, outside the fabric of the Roman state. So by the time of by by the early fourth century, when Constantine is becoming emperor that the Christian church has essentially constructed a welfare state, something that had never been seen before. Um, and this welfare state is administered by, by bishops who owe nothing to the traditional um, framework of Roman power at all. They're completely independent. So there is this enormous cuckoo in the nest. Now, Con Constantine, I think when he decides that he's going to favor the church has no real comprehension of this. Um, he has no idea that there that really he's going to have to deal with an independent source of power, nor does he understand and appreciate that 
actually the members of this church are very quarrelsome and that they have uh, a whole range of attitudes and views and opinions on who Christ is, how he should properly be understood, all these kind of things. Um, and this is a, a massive cause of anxiety for Constantine because the religio has to be right. If, if he doesn't get it right, then this is terrible for him and terrible for the empire. So it right. really, really matters that the understanding of Christ is the right one. And so that's why he, he summons um, people from across the empire, Christian leaders, to Nicaea, which is a city um, just south of the, um, the city that Constantine has decided is going to be the new capital of the empire, Greek city called Byzantium, which in typical modest style, Constantine... <laughs> changes its name to the city of Constantine, Constantinople. Yes. <laughs> and so um, the fact he doesn't summon them to, to, to Constantinople is a kind of measure of the way that he acknowledges their, if you like, their independence. The fact that they, the church can't just be subsumed within the fabric of imperial power, but the fact that it's absolutely within striking distance of Constantinople. I mean, Constantine is a kind of menacing presence <laughs> so yeah. so everyone is you know or everyone who's they're gathered aware. there is aware they're aware <laughs> of his presence yes but you know but 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 he's it's not like he is dictating what they have to to believe he wants he he doesn't know he, he he's summoning the experts to tell him um and and it's he sees it as being absolutely crucial to the future of the empire that they get this right and how long did it take them to hammer out the nicene creed it's. I mean, it takes them a while. Uh, I mean, several months. And yeah. it, it. It's. I mean, in the long run, the Nicene Creed will provide the the kind of the 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 orthodoxy that that most Christians today hold to still. But you know, it 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 takes time. And um, the chief heretic is. Uh, he's he's he, the heresy that is chiefly opposed to the Nicene Creed is has been formulated by a man called. Well, he's rather he's the spokesman for it who becomes identified with it a man called arius, arius um, yeah. and the story is is that um he 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 literally explodes in a great shower of excrement <laughs> and i think it's most unlikely he really did but there's a there's an obviously kind of uh symbolic um you know that he, he he's a schismatic uh and so he his body is literally torn to pieces and you mean the after the you wait, wait when when did on the streets of constantinople he's walking along and suddenly he just said he just explodes okay <laughs> yeah bits of flesh and excrement yeah that's what everywhere. happens to heretics that's what happens absolutely to yes well particularly if you're a kind of a sinister particularly sinister one um <laughs> and and for centuries afterwards um you know when the empire in the west falls and various barbarian kings establish their 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 realms over the rubble of the the the, the the, the, the toppled empire um a lot of these kings are arian because it enables them to be christian and therefore to identify with the, the god who had given the the romans their power but um because they're heretical because they're not um catholic nicene it enables them to kind of state their difference yeah uh, and, and it I... takes time for the arian heresy basically to, to 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 be purged from from catholic western europe yeah and speaking, of, so so, I want to jump to Pope Gregory in 590. I think he was elected Pope in 590 AD. Is that correct? Oh goodness, it's early in the morning. Yeah, it? oh, it's early. Yeah, for you. I think it was 590, <laughs> but yes, it's the end Pope, of the end of the Pope, century. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Pope Gregory was uh, a very skilled administrator and uh, a, you know a, cons a very skilled at consolidating power. So, is this is it, am I right in saying that this is kind of when what we know as the Roman Catholic Church began sort of with Pope Gregory? No. Um, so Gregory is, the, is called Gregory the Great. Okay. And he entirely merits that, that, that phrase. I think um, Calvin described him as, as the last Bishop of Rome who, who is deserving of respect. Um, okay. So even Calvin recognized his greatness. And he's actually... Uh, he, he he's not in any way um, a, a, a kind of papal figure in the way that that he will become in the Pope will become in the High Middle Ages, because he is um, Rome is under the rule of the Emperor in Constantinople, but it's it's 
you know, this one time capital of the empire is now essentially a kind of frontier town. Um, the, the, uh, the, the emperors in Byzantium had tried to reconquer Italy from, um, from the Goths. They'd succeeded, but then a, a few decades after that conquest, um, fresh waves of barbarians had come sweeping into Italy and the, uh, the emperor in Constantinople had been left with only a few strongholds, one of which was Rome. So Gregory is, is a, a, he's a subordinate of the emperor. He, he dates his missives by the, 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 the year of the reign of, of the emperor in Constantinople. Um, but he's, you know, he's in a frontier town and Rome is an absolute shadow of what it had been. Um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, chunks of masonry falling from the, the the great monuments in the forum all this kind of thing and so so gregory is a roman nobleman um so in that sense he is a kind you know maybe the last of the romans he he's a roman aristocrat who has an ancestral house on one of the hills of rome um and his election as pope reflects that fact at the same time, he is looking ahead to the the the, the, the claims to, to to power that his successors on the throne of Saint Peter will make. So he's a very kind of um, a kind of hinge figure. And the thing for which he's chiefly famous, certainly in England, is that he sends missionaries to uh, Kent to convert mm -hmm. the barbarians who have conquered the former province of Britain. And it turns out in the long run to be very successful. Um, and so the, the English always remember Gregory with great gratitude. And um, the claim is that at the end of days, when all the peoples of the world are gathered before the throne of Christ, it is Gregory who will make the case for the fact that the English are wholly steeped in sin. So we're, we're very grateful to him <laughs> in England. But what's interesting about, about his, his mission, you know, the, 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 this idea that um, the, the barbarians of Britannia should be brought back into the Christian fold is the reason that Gregory thinks that is that Britain had been a Roman province. So he's still thinking like a Roman. The, mm -hmm. Most Romans had assumed that Christianity was theirs, that you wouldn't want the barbarians to have it partly because barbarians wouldn't properly appreciate it because they're barbarians, but also because you don't want the barbarians kind of tapping into the, 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 the religio of Christ, because that might enable them to share in the, the favor of Christ. And that right. would be terrible. There are exceptions. Augustine, the great father of the church um, right. in the, in, in, in the late fourth and fifth century is notable for, for not thinking that. So he, you know, his greatest work, the city of, of, of God, city of cast God, yeah. the Roman Empire as merely part of the, the, the flux of things. So he's not unduly worried about its fall. And he sees the whole, you know, the whole world must, must, must go on a pilgrimage. The church is a pilgrim that is bound to tour the whole world. And so he, under, he, he kind of gets that. That's his take. Um, but one of the things that enables medieval Europe to leave that cast of mind and indeed the Pope to leave that, the, the papacy to leave that cast of mind is the fact that actually the English having been converted to Christianity proved to be incredibly effective missionaries. And they of course are not bound by a, a sense that only Romans should, should have Christianity. And so they have a, a share a sense of kinship with the Saxons in Germany. And so they send missionaries to convert the Germans, uh, the Saxons and so on. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and indeed, in due course, the, the, the peoples of Scandinavia, the Vikings and so on. Um, and so that sets in train this great wave of conversion that radically, radically broadens the reach of, um, of, of Western Christianity. And then, of course, Charlemagne, <laughs> Charles the Great, uh, kind of used the sword to, to spread the gospel around, across yes, Europe. Yes, he does. Which, yes, he does. So, so, yeah. so, so once you, um, once you start to get the idea that God wants a barbarian peoples beyond the ancient limits of Roman power to become Christian, there's an obvious temptation for earthly rulers who feel themselves a a appointed to their throne by God, which is to use the sword to convert. Uh, and that is exactly what Charlemagne does in his, his wars against the Saxons, mm -hmm. who, you know, which are, are very, very brutal. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of killing 
And Charlemagne's tread is a very heavy one. Uh, I mean, as heavy as, as, as you know, the heyday of, of, of the Roman Empire. And his policies are, are, are pretty similar. And Charlemagne actually achieves what the Roman emperors couldn't, which is to pacify vast swathes of Germany. And this causes anxiety among his advisors. So there's um, a Northumbrian from York, Alcuin, who is uh, Charlemagne's chief clerical advisor. And he basically says, whoa, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't really on at all. And that sets up a, a tension within the, you know, Christ's command to, to, to spread the gospel to limits of the earth. How do you do it? And what do you do with people who may not want to be brought into the universal brotherhood of, of, of Christendom? That, that Mutatis Mutandis is still with us to this day. What do you do with people who don't want Christianity? What do you do with people who, who, who don't want liberal values, who, who don't acknowledge the existence of human rights? I mean, these are questions that, even though they have evolved, are still absolutely with Western leaders to this day. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, we'll skip over the Crusades, but I want to I want to go back quickly to to Bede um, in the eighth century, the venerable Bede, because that was a, a major turning point. I mean, he changed time. He changed the calendar. Correct. And and how did how did he do that? How did he accomplish this? Well, it's it's Bede is not him, the person who first comes up with the idea that that the dates should be fixed to the um, to the incarnation. But he is the person who who really kind of popularizes it. So, so I mean, Bede is an. A, a, I love Bede. Um, he he's from, he's from the north of England. Um, he is kind of the second, third generation of people to be converted by Christianity. It's a precarious faith. It's a tough time. Um, it's likely that uh, Bede gives a description of a monastery that's wiped out by a plague and only the abbot and a, a young boy survives. And it's very likely that that young boy was Bede himself. So he's living in hard times, but he devotes himself um, to the service of Christ and to, um, and to making sense of the world in Christian terms in the most sweeping way that he can. And Bede is probably the greatest scholar of his age, which is incredible considering he's absolutely he's on the absolute periphery of, of, of things. And among the many achievements of his scholarship is to fix the nature of time. Um, so the fact that we're recording this in Anno Domini 2023 the year of the our fact, Lord. Yes. reflects the fact that 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 that, that Bede restructured time until that until that moment there were many many different ways of ordering time you might do it through the regnal years of a king uh, you might do it through a you know a, a, a celebrated event in history um, in Rome people might still do it from the founding of the city all these kind of things so multiple multiple ways of dating which could have, of course generated all kinds of confusion but Bede, Bede is the guy who says I think I think let's do it from from the birth of Christ yeah. Um, and, you know, at the, be at the beginning of this talk, I said how the expansion of European power over the colonial period meant that even people who were not converted to Christianity, uh, nevertheless, were profoundly stamped by, um, by, by, by Christian ways of thinking. And I think that the fact that the Christian calendar is universal now, it's used in North Korea, it's used, yeah. you know, I mean... The Islamic State, of course, use the, the, use the Islamic calendar, but they, they still have to, you know, if they're using computers or something, they still have right. to use the Christian calendar. <laughs> I mean, that is the most striking example, I think. Um, and, I, 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 and it's fascinating the, the way in which um, people in the West who, who were nervous about the implications of that try and disguise it. So, um, you know, BCE, before the Common Era, as though that in any way disguises it. I mean, why is it the common era? You're still dating it to the birth of Christ. I mean, I know, it's, it, right. it's insane. It's like you're, yeah, it's like you're painting over dry rot. You're, you yeah, know, you're trying to you like know. sort of secularize this, you yeah. know, these years. Yeah, it, that's, that's interesting. I was going to ask you about that. Um, 
Uh, but I let's I want to jump to Galileo because uh, there's you know there's so many kind of myths around why he was imprisoned or why he was in house arrest and what happened with him in Pope Urban I think it was Urban, or Pope Urban the eighth he was so uh, what, what I know can tell you about the Pope is that he was um a, he was a, a nobleman he was very defensive of his dignity um, he'd been a, a friend and a patron. Of Galileo and he felt that Galileo had ended up kicking him in the teeth um Galileo in a in one of his texts had essentially cast the Pope as as an idiot um so but he was put Galileo was put on trial because he he believed that the the earth rotated around the sun so uh, um, no it, it it wasn't specifically that he it, he was not being put on trial because of that he was being put on trial because he continued to argue that it was essentially proven when it wasn't. And the opinion of the, um, so, so when he started making this case, um, and obviously he wasn't the first to make it Copernicus. Copernicus. Him, yeah. Um, Copernicus had been fine. What aggravated, uh, the, um, the, the, the inquisition, what brought the Inquisition down on Galileo's head was that uh, he started making this case and the Inquisitor said, well, is this actually, is this actually true? Um, can you prove it? And Galileo couldn't prove it. And so the, the Inquisitors, very, in a very kind of detailed and measured and methodical way, kind of convened various experts um, tried to kind of work out what the, the consensus was, what the likelihood was, what the balance of probability was. And the balance of probability was held to be that it wasn't proven and that therefore the likelihood was that the sun was revolving around the earth. And so the, the, the inquisitor said to Galileo, well, you know, this is the consensus um, and, and you should stick to it. And you shouldn't go around saying that it's it's been, you know, that this is absolutely the case right uh, and and galileo ignored it um and continued to kind of pump out his um various texts in which he's being rude about the pope and all kinds of things um and that this this annoyed the inquisition and so they they silenced him um but he had you know the the the, the kind of the, the myth that galileo had proven that the earth uh, revolved around the sun and that this was um offensive to the catholic church and therefore galileo was silenced because this is what he was teaching isn't true it's the fact that galileo was arguing for something that according to the consensus of the time which you know the church had gone to great efforts to to identify what simply wasn't proven and it wasn't proven for a very you know for for, for, a, for a fair while after that um, and, but yeah. but it provides it provides enemy, it provides Protestants in particular with an absolute paradigm of everything that they find darkest about the church. So the idea that um, Galileo is silenced by sinister inquisitors who torture him and throw him into prison and all this kind of stuff isn't true. Right. Um, so Protestants are, are fighting Catholics in the Thirty Years' War. It, it's, you know, the, 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 the Reformation is... And the Counter-Reformation, uh, you know, this is the kind of the, the bloodiest moment in its history. Um, so it it provides obvious kind of propagandistic scope. And in due course, this Protestant propaganda will be picked up by Voltaire and various Enlightenment figures yes. for whom it provides a paradigm of everything that they despise, not just about the Catholic Church, but about religion full stop. Um, so right. Voltaire's famous rallying cry, Crasé l'infâme, let's wipe out this this horrific you know awful thing by which he means catholic church but more broadly christianity um and it's passed into the bloodstream of of you know anti-religious atheists to this day and i i think it kind of exemplifies the way in which um so much atheist anti-christian propaganda is basically reheated protestant propaganda um I, I, and i think i go so far as to say that 
atheism of the kind of Richard Dawkins variety is basically mm -hmm. a kind of logical endpoint for trends within Protestantism. And the the kind of the anti-popery is is one manifestation of that. Yeah. Oh, well, you mentioned Voltaire. That's that was actually my next point because you you talk about this man Jean, Jean Calais C Calais. I don't Jean Calais, know how yeah. Calais, yeah. Calais, Jean Calais, uh, in Toulouse. And um, talk about what happened with this man and how Voltaire responded to that. And, and so, how that uh, kind of so Calais is, is a, a Huguenot, uh, it's a, a Protestant at a time where um, Protestantism has no real legal sanction at all. Um, you know, the in France, have been so pers persecuted in France, yes, in, in, in France, that most of them have, have fled abroad. Um, so he's an object of, of natural suspicion. He ends up being accused of the murder of his own son. He gets broke, he, he gets executed very horribly, broken on a wheel. Um, and it's 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 widely seen as being a travesty of justice. And mm -hmm. Voltaire takes up the case. Voltaire is just across the border from France in Switzerland. So he's he's able to write as he pleases. Um, and, and of he's course, a brilliant right. He's a brilliant writer. A brilliant writer but, but of course, um, a... Switzerland is he, he's in Geneva. Switzerland is is Protestant. Um, yeah. So. He's he's kind of, you know, this 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 equation of uh, enlightenment perspectives with kind of Protestant hostility to the Catholic Church. There's a kind of hint of it there, I think. But I think what's more interesting about it is that actually Voltaire's campaign um, is successful, and it convinces Catholic leaders, um, both secular and religious, in France. That a, that, that a, a miscarriage of justice had happened. And um, people in France accept the justice of what Voltaire is saying. And what I think is revelatory about this is firstly that Catholics in France are perfectly able to recognize the justice of what Voltaire is saying. They, they mm -hmm. accept the force of his campaign. But I think what's more, even more suggestive is the question of why does Voltaire care? What is it about the spectacle of an innocent man accused of, of crimes that he didn't commit being publicly broken on a hideous instrument of torture? What is it about this spectacle that seems to strike something so deep within Voltaire's heart, within his, within his soul? And you'd have to say, would someone from a culture that wasn't shaped by the spectacle of someone innocent being executed on a public instrument of torture be quite so affected? And I think probably not. I think that Voltaire's horror at the fate of this innocent man it is profoundly reflective of the fact that at the center of Christian culture is the figure of Christ on the cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and was this event of the 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 death of Jean Kaila? Uh, am I saying that right again? I, yeah, I Jean Kaila. Yeah, yeah, Jean Kaila. Is is this event? Was this one of the main kind of sparks of the Enlightenment? This event. It, it, it's one of the kind of the famous rallying cries, but there's a kind of, you know it's a kind of broad, you know, and, and the Enlightenment itself is, I think unthinkable without Christianity. Yeah. And I think that what you see over and over again is that um, Christian civilized to, 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 fa to build a civilization intellectually, culturally, morally um, on Christian values is a bit, well, I probably shouldn't say this to someone living in California, but it's a bit like building a great city on the San Andreas fault. <laughs> <laughs> because every so often there's going to, you know, the big one is going to come and everything yeah. is going to be sent kind of wobbling and shaking and, and, and falling because the, the idea of being born again, of, of, um, of being baptized, of having your sins washed away is obviously central to, to Christian teaching. And what happens um, in the Middle Ages in Western Europe is that, Various radicals 
come to apply that model to the whole fabric of society. So the mm -hmm. first reformation isn't in the 16th century, it's in the 11th century, um, with, when reformers who are particularly associated with the office of the, the, the Bishop of Rome, they, sit, they kind of seize the commanding heights of the, of, of the Bishopric of Rome, and they use it to force through what effectively is, is Europe's first revolution, this, this, this attempt to, to cleanse and purify the whole fabric of, of Christendom and everybody within it. Um, so, so the medieval church isn't a reactionary or a hidebound institution. It's absolutely the opposite. It's, it's a revolutionary institution. But it's the nature of revolutions that they, you know, the lava starts to calcify, it starts to, to, to solidify and freeze and chill. And the, 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 the revolutionaries of one age become the established, the hidebound establishment of a later age. And so that is what then precipitates a further eruption of reformatio, of reformation in the 16th century. Um, and mm -hmm. what the reformers in the 16th century are doing is saying that, um, you know, people are in darkness, we have to bring them into light. Um, they're worshipping idols, we have to topple these idols. They're, they're mired in superstition, we have to pull them out from this superstition. And that's essentially what the what Voltaire and the philosoph, the, 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 the kind of the, mm -hmm. the radical thinkers of the Enlightenment are doing. They are, except that, that whereas the Protestant reformers had turned their guns on the, the Roman church, what the more radical among the, the philosophers are doing are turning it on the, the entire fabric of Christianity. And yeah. that, I think, is, is something that you see throughout modernity. And it's, it's what enables me to say that in societies that you know, going into the 20th century are increasingly um, slipping the, 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 the anchor of doctrinal Christianity, but their assumptions are remain so Christian that often the reason that they are rejecting Christianity is for Christian reasons. And perhaps the exemplification of that is um, the revolution that uh, follows in you know, a, a, a few decades after Voltaire's um, defense of, of, of Calais, which is the French Revolution, right? Because the French Revolution targets the church institutionally, but it does it for profoundly Christian reasons. You know, the, and explain Christ, that because the no, radical, because... so the radicalism of Christ's teaching, the last fraternite, uh, yeah, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? Yeah, so yeah, so so so, so, so that that you know the, the idea that that there is a kind you know a, of a radical egalitarianism but more than that it's more radical than that because there is this idea that the last shall be first and that the first shall be last and that is what the revolution is all about it's it's the it's the promotion of the people to a kind of sovereign state and the taking of the king and queen in tumbrils to be executed in a, in a, in a public square i mean it's it it's it's the christian message turned very 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 radical very dark and so uh, radical and the reason yeah. that the church is being targeted is that it is seen as 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 corrupt as part of the oppressive apparatus of of the elites who have to be toppled yeah i don't know if you read citizens by simon Sharma. Have, have you yeah. read that oh yeah, yeah it's it's stunning um but yeah, Robespierre marches into, I think it was, I mean, I think he, it was him. I don't, I don't think this is apocryphal. He marched into Notre Dame and declared it a temple of reason. Yeah. But what you're saying is that was all based. I mean, the, the undergirding of that was a, was a Christian assumption. Yes. The whole thing. Absolutely. And the, so, so the markers of, um, uh, of the first revolution back in the 11th century, um, are uh, a kind of a, a, a radical desire to separate the fabric of the church from the, the fabric of the state. Um, this idea that to cleanse and purify Christendom, the church itself must be completely sacrosanct, that there, there must be, you know, earthly, earthly powers must have, hold no sway over it. And this is an idea that absolutely gets enshrined in by the French revolutionaries in the notion that, that, um, the people, the laos, to use the Christian, the Greek Christian term, um, must be absolutely separated from from what there has come to be called religions. So churches are shoved to one side. 
Um, and this is the, you know, still today, the French call um, their, their, their policy of radical secularism, laïcité. But this is unthinkable without the original 11th century revolution, which kind of separates church and state in this very, very radical way. And the um, the whole kind of apparatus that, uh, that, that, that is bred by this revolution in the 11th century, so armed warriors spreading this message to the ends of the earth in the form of crusades, um, the emergence of, of novel institutions called universities, the construction of new legal frameworks that can govern this radical new order. Again, all of this is what we see in the wake of the French Revolution. Um, and I think that the French Revolution is best understood as a non-Christian Christian revolution. Yeah. So I want to jump to, to Charlie Hebdo. Uh, Charlie Hebdo is a French satirical magazine, and many people will, rem will remember that in 2015, two gunmen forced their way into the offices and killed 12 of the staff members of this because of this magazine because they put a, a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad on the cover in a very, yeah. um, uh, how would you describe the, the way Blasphemous. he was portrayed? very blasphemous way. So talk about the Charlie Hebdo event. Tra talk about that event and how that magazine, the people at that magazine made a fatal kind of mistake in understanding the difference between Christianity and Islam. Well, so, so, so to go back to this idea that the secular is, 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 is an expression of Christian assumptions. I mean, it's it's very, very deep rooted in the fabric of Christendom. The idea that you that that you know, I mean, the, the words uh, uh, religion and secular come from the Latin. The religio we've talked about this idea that there's a kind of bond, and the bond specifically is what joins the Christian people to the the eternity of heaven. Um, and the cyclum, you know, for Augustine and for for for, for uh, his people who, who, who are influenced by him, the cyclum embodies the flux of time on which human lives are bound, empires are bound, everything is bound. And so it, it, it's the idea, to, it, it's the ambition to escape the flux and swirl and sweep of the cyclum that, that encourages reformers in the 11th century to promote this separation, if you like, of church and state, which over the course of the centuries comes to be reified as what in English we would call religion and the secular. So the mm -hmm. idea that that there is something called the secular and the idea that there are religions that are separate from the secular, you know, this is one of the assumptions that I talked about right at the start of this uh, of our conversation. I'd always taken that for granted. I'd always assumed that, that of course, everybody thought about that, but they didn't in right. the part, you know, so this is one of the, you know, I'd look at, at, at ancient Athens, say, and, and, and say, well, can I use the word secular? I couldn't. Because everything in in Athens is saturated with a, with a kind of an appreciation and understanding of the of the supernatural and the divine, the the earthly and the divine are so interfused that it's you know it's like trying to separate a, a, a gin and a tonic. I mean, you you can't do it. It's utterly utterly suffused and interfused. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 radicalism and the novelty of a huge part of it of of Christianity in the West is that. This separation of religion and the secular comes to be completely taken for granted, right? And take uh, uh, and it's exported. So it's another of the things, a bit like the dating system, that gets exported by the European colonial powers across the world. And other other areas of the world have to kind of come to terms or or, or, or try and adapt themselves to this understanding. So it happens in India. It happens. Uh, specifically across the muslim world there is nothing in islam that corresponds to the, the the western christian understanding of the secular the idea that religion is something that that exists separate from something called the secular the idea that islam is a religion is an entirely christian one and so over the period of of of, of western cultural supremacy Muslims basically had to accommodate themselves to that idea. They could either accept it and kind of start to recalibrate Islam so that it becomes a religion in the in the, mm -hmm. the Christian sense, or they can violently reject it. Uh, but they're still 
existing in the context of the kind of the, the, the cultural global superiority of that Christian idea of, of the secular. And if you're a Muslim who is coming to a, a Western country, the strain on you is even greater because a Western country will grant you freedom of religion. But what it won't do is accept or even acknowledge that you might not want to feel that your your world is divided up into the secular and 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 and, and a sense of religion and and what we call muslim radicals it, it, you know extreme um islamic radicals are basically people who who want to collapse the whole idea of the secular mm -hmm. who want islam to permeate and govern every aspect of the state, indeed of the entire world. Uh, and this is obviously something that cannot be accommodated within a Western secular state, and particularly not within a state like France, where the idea of the secular is the governing ideological principle of the, of, of, of the entire way that, that, that people in France conceive of, of their, their, their society and their civilization. So, the, the the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo see themselves as being against equally all religion. Mm -hmm. They they despise it. They see themselves as upholding laicite, the, the, the this idea of the of, of the secular. But in fact, they are not treating religions equally because their assumptions are themselves Christian, right. and the 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 abuse that they turn say not you know i mean it's not just against muhammad it's against the virgin or jesus or the pope or whoever it's actually very protestant you can trace it back you know that 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 line of inheritance that line of tradition in france back beyond the enlightenment back to the back to the protestant reformation and mm -hmm. and the kind of the violence that was exercised in the reformation against um icons and so on religious art so Catholics don't obviously don't like it, but they're kind of habituated to it. They're used to it. They've had 500 years of it. Mm -hmm. They understand the rules of the game. <laughs> um, right. But Muslims don't. Right. To Muslims, it's, it's, it's violently blasphemous in a way that I think French secularists find it very difficult to get a handle on. Because mm -hmm. French secularists don't want to recognize their own line of descent from, from the Christian past. And I think that, that this explains a huge part of why Islam has been peculiarly hard to accommodate within the fabric of Western liberal states. Is that Western, li the Western liberals don't understand the fact that their liberalism and their secularism is itself are themselves culturally contingent right, right. you know well, they think yeah. they think of course the secular just is like kind of you know dogs exist or trees but it doesn't it's it's a specifically culturally bred way of seeing the world and there are other ways of seeing it and you can see this i think very clearly in events of, of, of the past few years in countries that were colonized either literally colonized or mentally colonized by the west in it, it during its apogee so india or, or turkey both of which in different ways came to accept that there was something called the secular and both of which so un, uh, uh, under Mo modi in india or under erdogan in turkey mm -hmm. are, are, are decisively turning their backs on the idea of the secular trying to go back to a kind of pre Right. Pre-colonial period. Uh, try and kind of, you know, in the case of, of, of Modi, what he calls Hindutva, uh, an attempt to get back to a world in which what what in the West is called Hinduism isn't a religion, but is just, you know, the water in which Indians swim. And likewise, yeah. in, in Turkey, um, a, a, a a desire basically on the part of Erdogan to repudiate the secularism that Ataturk um, introduced when the Ottoman Empire fell and the Turkish Republic was established and kind of return to an understanding of Islam as something that saturates the entire fabric of the state.
Yeah. Um, well, I want to jump to the penultimate thing uh, I want to jump to is uh, your last chapter, which is called Woke. And talk about the Christian assumptions of the, I want to quote you, talk about the Christian assumptions of the Me Too movement and the Women's March. Um, in this chapter, Woke, you say the human body was not an object, not a commodity to be used by the rich and powerful as and when they pleased. 2,000 years of Christian sexual morality had resulted in men as well as women widely taking this for granted. Had it not, then the me, hashtag Me Too would have had no force. Uh, so talk about that. Talk about the assumption, the Christian assumptions of the Me Too movement. Okay, so what very few people <laughs> in public life said when the Harvey Weinstein case broke. Incidentally, Harvey, today in, in, in Los Angeles, Harvey Weinstein was convicted of 16 more years of... In, of right. Uh, so, of so what nobody said, nobody in public life said when, when, when the um, accusations against him broke was, uh, well, so what? He's a powerful man. He can do what he like with his inferiors. Right. Nobody said that. <laughs> Everyone said, oh, this is terrible. But why should we assume it was terrible? If you, if you go back to the pre-Christian world, if you go back to Rome, it's an absolute given that powerful men who rule their household can do what they like with their inferiors. They can use them sexually any way they want. Doesn't makes no difference what their what you know what the sex is what the uh, the way they use them sexually what their age is you know absolutely fine um, and or if you go back to Darwin and just the stronger eats the weak and we're just you know we're products of well, natural selection I mean it's a little well, bit different but but still the Darwin the well I, well I, I I'm not sure it is because I think I think that that what the Christian sexual revolution shows is that actually there are all kinds of ways that humans are capable of formulating sexual morality. The Romans had a sexual morality. It's just, it was very, very different to ours. You know, they had taboos, they had things that shocked them or definitely, but it wasn't what we had, what shocks us. What shocks us is the idea that um, powerful men have the right to rape their inferiors. Mm -hmm. And, it took many, 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 many centuries for this understanding to be instilled in the, the broad mass of the people. And it's been instilled so successfully that today we completely take it for granted. And the yeah, idea and is, the idea is that, I mean, it's ultimately, it's founded on, on St. Paul's teaching that the, 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 the proper relationship of a man and a woman, you know, the only acceptable sexual relationship is between a man and a woman in a monogamous relationship, because that is modeled on the relationship of Christ and his church. Right. Um, and this is something that is, is taught throughout the middle ages and it gets, it continues into the, into the reformation. Um, when we use the word Puritan, this idea of, of, of someone who is purifying himself, himself, herself, keep that's operating on the sexual dimension as well as the broader moral dimension. Um, a Puritan is someone who, a, a ma in, you know, if it's a man, is someone who is trying to keep his body and his mind sexually pure. And the only acceptable form of relationship is, is with his wife. Um, so you, uh, a Puritan man has to rein in his desires, has to rein mm -hmm. in his appetites, has to respect the fact that um, that women's bodies are not just for his use, that they have a, a have to respect the bodily integrity of of women. Um, and this is obviously the um, the morality that the the Pilgrim Fathers and the um, the, the, the Puritans who come to uh, New England bring with them and which has been so influential on, on American sexual morality. And it's, it's what um, Margaret Atwood, when she wrote The Handmaid's Tale, satirized. Mm -hmm. um, the Handmaid's Tale is a satire on, on, on the Puritanism of New England, among many other things. Um, and while the Harvey Weinstein case was kind of rumbling through, there was a TV adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale. And so... 
the idea that um you know the women in their white bonnets and their red dresses became an emblem of uh male of 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 Harvey Weinstein you know the age of Harvey Weinstein the age of Donald Trump um all the uh, the women's protests that erupted when Trump was um, inaugurated through the streets of of, of lo- countless American cities, and this was seen as be you know women dressing up as handmaids um, mm-hmm. was seen as 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 people who were striking a blow against predatory masculine behaviour. But the paradox is is that they they are what they're demanding. What they were demanding was that men behave like Puritans. <laughs> so they're dressing <laughs> yeah, up. You know, they're, 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 yeah. they're dressing up to channel the satire, a satire against Puritanism to demand that men behave like Puritans. And it, for me, it absolutely exemplifies the way in which in the West, and perhaps particularly in America, there's a kind of a, a, a Moebius strip in the attitude of liberals towards Christianity mm-hmm. that that. Christian assumptions are being used to criticize Christian doctrines and vice versa. It's, it, and, and it's terribly confusing. And I, I think I cannot think of a single aspect of the culture wars in America that, that are not essentially intra-Christian theological arguments. The idea that, mm-hmm. that, that America is riven between Christians on the one side and progressives or liberals or atheists or whatever you want to call them on the other seems to me absolutely wrong and in fact flattering to the prejudices of both sides both sides are essentially christian both right. sides are deploying christian arguments um it's just a question of 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 which aspect of christian teaching should be privileged so right. you know the, the the classic uh the old classic culture war in america about abortion obviously the the, the idea that um uh, life is sacred is a fundamental Christian principle. Mm-hmm. And I, th- whenever I, whenever I, um, I, I, I read about protests against abortion, I, th- I think back to um, Christians in the, in the Roman world, touring the rubbish tips, rescuing babies who had been abandoned. Right. Um, but, but because in the Roman world, the idea that you could dispose of unwanted children again was completely taken for granted. It wasn't seen as, as anything evil. It was, it was, of course, why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's obviously a very deep rooted Christian principle, but so too is the one that I was just talking about the idea that, um, that, that, that a woman has bodily autonomy, that she has control over her own body, that, she, that, right. that it's up to her to decide what she does with it. So those are two Christian principles, neither of which would have been accepted by, in the pre-christian world that are going head to head right and likewise say with trans issues you know which is the kind of hot button issue of the moment um of course the idea that that god created man and woman separate absolutely fundamental to christian teaching um, i mean you know absolutely core irreducible but so too is the idea that um those who are most persecuted are perhaps closest to god uh, and therefore have a kind of privilege. Um, and there is a kind of privilege in victimhood that trans campaigners are absolutely utilizing. Mm-hmm. So even though right. it would probably appall them to think that um, there are, you know, that, 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 that their campaign is, is rested, you know, rests on Christian assumptions, it clearly does. Right. And I think that the, the problem for, for America now and, and more broadly for everyone in the West is that whereas previously, so say in the, in the, the era of the civil rights movement, um, pretty much everyone shared the same language. They, 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 they read the same scriptures. They were familiar with Christian teachings. They went to church. They, they were, they were habituated. They could recognize, um, what it was that was Christian about the arguments they were making. That's no longer the case. So the people don't share the same language. People don't share, don't recognize the same grammar. And that's why I think the, the culture wars in America today are so peculiarly scrambled is that mm-hmm. they are arguments about Christian doctrine, but only one side recognizes that. Right. Right. Um, 
And you say at the end of, uh, I'll just quote you at the, uh, the end of your book, you say, Christianity, it seemed, had no need of actual Christians for its assumptions to still flourish. And then you go on to say, even in Europe, a continent with churches far emptier than those in the United States, the trace elements of Christianity continue to infuse people's morals and presumptions to, so utterly that they many failed even to d detect their presence. Like dust, yeah. part of, like dust yeah. particles, so fine as, as to be invisible to the naked eye, they were breathed in equally by everyone, believers, atheists, and those who never paused much, so much as to think about religion. Had it been otherwise, then no one would ever have got woke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to, I, I want to end on this. I want to ask you, because I mean, this, I mentioned to you this earlier, but you interacted with all of these texts, obviously with the Bible, with the Christian texts, with uh, uh, theologians. What did did it have any impact on you in terms of your under your faith or lack of faith, or did how did it so, shape so, you? So, and, so what it what it clarified for me was that um, that kind of hunch that I'd had, that kind of itch. That, that that the more I scratched it, the more I came to appreciate that that I am Christian in pretty much every way culturally that 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 all my and and that my yearnings are Christian too, and that when I read um you know right the way through from 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 Paul through the church fathers through the the great writers of the middle ages the um the 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 great writers of the Reformation right the way into the present that these are, 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 are people who are explaining me to myself um, mm -hmm. and they, they move me and clarify for me. Uh, they explain me to myself in a way that um, kind of makes me embarrassed really that I hadn't, I hadn't properly understood this. And what it also brings home to me is that actually this is a vast kind of cultural resource that lots of Christians I know ignore. Um, it, it, it actually astounds me that 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 all this incredible wealth, accumulated wisdom and teachings of, of two thousand years of Christianity, is less read than it than perhaps it should be. I think, and on one level, I feel completely Christian. On the other, um, I still struggle to believe in God. Well, I'll so, tell you this. So, uh, so yeah. um, whether, I mean, I would like to, it would kind of, I, I, I've read so much about, <clears throat> you know, what it must be to believe it. I mean, it must be. Yeah. Well, kind of like being on a drug, I guess. It so, is. It is. Um, it, no, a kind I'll, of high. I'll tell you just a quick, uh, just a bit of my story. I mean, until 13 years ago, my entire adult life, I was at the very least an agnostic and at most an atheist. And then some Christians invited me to an evangelical church in Hollywood. And I reluctantly went uh, and I heard the preacher came out and preached the, on Romans chapters, Paul's one of Paul's epistles, Romans chapter seven. And I, it was a supernatural it was a it was a damascene moment i mean he preached the gospel and it was the first time that i'd really understood and heard the gospel it, it was it was the holy spirit taking the scales from my eyes and i had a a a dramatic road to damascus conversion in that moment and i was so stunned by it and uh i still am stunned by it and uh but what the my point in telling you this is that 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 supernatural moment of being born again, which is because it's funny to me when people call Christians born again Christians, because that's a redundant statement. You, they're, they're the only kind of Christian you can be is a born again Christian. Uh, Jesus clearly teaches that in, in the Gospels when he talking when he talks to Nicodemus. But that moment of being born again is a supernatural moment in time that happens that God does to you. And it, it's, it's nothing you can conjure up yourself. You can't conjure up your own belief. God has to remove, as it, as it were, remove the scales from your eyes 
And in that moment, it's just, and it was such a profound, and it still is such a profound thing that happened in my life. And all I would say to you is, all you can do is ask God well, to reveal so, himself. Ask so, God to reveal himself to you. So I, I would read about, so I always viewed Puritans as enemies. I mean, I kind of, you know, killjoys who turn up and pull down maypoles and stop people celebrating Christmas and all this kind of thing. <laughs> um, and then I would, I, I would read about experiences of the kind that you describe. Um, people surprised by God or uh, mm -hmm. the descent of the spirit, the fire, all this kind of thing. Um, and be, and kind of be very moved by, it. or reading about Luther. I mean, his, his experience. Yeah. Um so, so on, I, I find that very kind of very powerful. But equally, I find the um, I, I find medieval Christianity incredibly powerful as well. I, I find the idea of so, so I talked about bead. Um, I, mm -hmm. I've, I'm cr terribly moved by by people like that, um, by people who lived in a world where. The mysteries of. Christianity are manifest in everything where everything there's a kind of sacrality about the whole order of life and, mm -hmm. and everything kind of, I suppose. Where actually this, the, 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 the sacred is, is more accessible, is more readily accessible. And if you like, maybe one of the reasons why I find it, difficult is that actually i'm spoiled for choice i can't <laughs> you know I, I i find the whole sweep of of of, of christian history it, it's an it's embarrassment so of riches yes. it's an embarrassment of riches so so maybe who knows i don't know but yeah um well let's leave I, it I've, there I've, Let's leave it there, and um, we're going to pray for you to have a de Democene oh, moment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. But guys, thank you get much. the book. It's called Dominion. The subtitle is How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. Thank you, Tom Holland, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, guys, and we will see you next week.